So thank you all for um, coming to the first session of the book club. I'm Mikhail, and I volunteered indeed to um, facilitate the this book club on a book by Rob Heinemann and George. Sorry if I butcher the pronunciation. George Athanasopoulos on forecasting principle and practice. So. Honestly, I don't have any knowledge at all on forecasting, but I am quite interested in it. And as usual, I guess, rather than learning thing, new things on my own, I would just help the book, facilitate the book club so that we can learn together. So this book club, this book consists of 13 chapters. So we'll discuss the first chapter um, in the session. So, and there are several important links, well, other than the link to the actual book itself. So there are two links that would be important for all of us throughout the uh, book club. So you can find the sign up sheet for the presentation in the Slack channel. So if you go to the Slack and then right under the name of the book club, you can find the links, including the, li the link to the book. And as many um, R4DS community book club has done, we can also make, um, incorporate our learning notes into this um, book down website. And I think there are guidance on how one can contribute to the um, book down in the R4DS YouTube. But I'll go into that later. So before going into the first chapter, I think I would um, like to discuss the pace of this book club. So previously I have, well, John has made the template uh, for the sign up sheet in which one week is allocated for each chapter. I think it's okay for chapter one, but maybe we want to allocate more time for the future chapters. So I understand that other book clubs, such as the ISLR book club, as mentioned by Ricardo, allocate two weeks per chapter. So one week to discuss the uh, materials and then the next week to discuss the exercises. So, um, Whereas for the Statistical Rethinking Book Club, so um, we only meet to discuss the exercises, but that's only because Richard McElroy, the author of the book itself, has made an amazing set of presentation on the material. So of course, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, nor we are confident enough to think that we can present the materials better than him. So we just need to discuss the exercises. And for this book club, I'm not aware of any set of video lectures that accompany the, um, this book. So personally, I would go with um, allocating two weeks per chapter. So one week on um, discussing the materials, so just the summary of the um, chapter itself. And we can further discuss the problems that we have while reading the chapter. And then we can, and then the next week we can discuss the exercises. So, um, well, for the exercises, yeah, there are also other ways, many ways we can determine um, how it should be done, whether one, pe one person should just um, present a, select, um, a selection of the problems, or maybe many people will join together to discuss the problems that they like. So I guess, yeah, there are um, a few things that I would like to discuss. And of course, the discussion is not limited to only those 
who are attending the this meeting, I would also um, put it on the Slack channel and maybe within a few days, then we can um, decide how we should um, make the book club. But I guess for the time being, I would like to hear what you think, what is your experience so far and how it works because, um, well, if we uh, put um, two weeks per chapter, then we will have 25 weeks in total into this book club. Well, provided that all of us persist until the end of the book club. So yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah, I think personally, I'm, so I'm in the ISLR club as well. I'm facilitating the fourth cohort and I mean, this seems a little bit different in some ways, like not all the chapters introduce new techniques. Like some of it is kind of like foundational. This is how you plot time series. This is how you decompose them. Here are some concepts about different kinds of features you can extract. I think, I think maybe we could be flexible. Like some chapters we might want to do two weeks on and do exercises in the second and some chapters, especially early on, we can just do one week, uh, at least that's my opinion. I think this stuff later on will be more interesting as like a lab, like, you know, when we're doing time series regression and exponential smoothing and ARIMA and like kind of after seven maybe, but you know, it's just my opinion. Yeah, sure. I think what I like about all this uh, book club is the flexibility that we can put. Either it's a blessing or a curse, but to me, it's mostly blessing. And I guess there are also um, other things that we can include into the uh, book club, I guess, um, such as using machine learning methods such as XGBoost for forecasting, because, well, it seems like it's all the reach or maybe at, it's all there is for time series prediction mm -hmm. nowadays, at least in the Twitter space. Mm -hmm. And it's not included in the chapter, at least as far as I can see. So maybe we can also have one session for that and maybe also for automation or production because it, it seems to be quite important nowadays for the practice of forecasting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess, um, maybe we can just be flexible and as we go through, we can incorporate what we like or what we want to discuss together. And maybe yeah, we can improvise um, along the way. Yeah. So, yeah. Like okay. I don't see the hand, so that's what I'm <laughs> raising the hand here. <laughs> All right, yeah, sure. I guess I'm used to Microsoft Teams or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, good, good, good points here. Uh, I, I like the, the idea from Kevin about the flexibility, okay? That we can have maybe some chapters, you know, one week would be, would be enough. You know, we don't want to be, <laughs> we don't want to be the dead horse, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is how, how many people are in this cohort? How many are we supposed to be? Well, you, you'll never know, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, uh, in theory, in theory, how many people sign up for, for, uh, for this cohort? Oh, I'm not sure about that. So, um, so for the sign up sheet, I uh -huh. only have the information, um, like the top three time slots. Okay. Oh, so for this time slot, there are three people who can join. So I guess it mm -hmm. will be only the three of us, I guess. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, so I think that's quite also quite important to discuss the um because yeah, to determine the pace. Right. Okay, so it's it's a small group. That, that's okay. You know, we can we can work with that. Uh one of the things that uh it will be interesting, you know, if uh if if you know people have the time is to try to uh you know, try to do those lab exercises. Uh, let's say, uh, 
you know, try to do it on, 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 their, on our own or maybe uh, take another slot, you know, to, to try to discuss them. Because th there are many ways, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to, to approach the, these problems, these time series problems. And um, for example, I have been uh, uh, taking some training. I don't know if you know about the, about the business science, uh, Matt Danko, you know, that yeah. is, uh, that, yeah. that is prom promoting every, every week, every week. Yeah. Okay, I'll say so, yeah. So I, I, have, I haven't had the time, you know, to go to the time series because I have the five uh, course track there. But uh, one of the things that he does very well is that you know he has these packages you know the model time mm -hmm. the time tk and all that that also we could incorporate in our you know in, in our lab exercises because as far as uh, as i've seen especially in the chapters that i sign up uh rob you know the author is using more his uh you know his packages right you know the, the yeah. t, t -Sibyl, uh forecast etc and that's fine you know that they, they work but i think that it could be some benefit to try other, you know, other packages and other methodologies, okay, mm -hmm. and see more or less, you know, what's the difference, uh, especially in the, in the execution and, and the accuracy that we can get. So, you know, there are some, some, some things to, you know, to ponder. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, um, the idea of the production also came up because I also see his, um, yeah, his tweets. And I think it's really, yeah. well, it has some materials on that, right? On automation and ensuring that R can be put into production for forecasting practice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm totally into it. So if, uh, well, I only know like what are the packages that he made, but I haven't really put into the time into knowing more about the packages. So I think it would be a good time to incorporate those packages into this um, along the way. So, all right. So I guess if, so that's pretty much decided then. So um, regarding the structure of the book club. So um, I'm not entirely sure whether someone has signed up for the second chapter or have, okay, well, We'll see later. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I will go into the um, the first chapter on getting start started in forecasting. So if you have any question, please just um, either raise your hand. I, at least I can still see you, or yeah, you know, just uh, speak. So I would just go into the. Uh, subheadings that they have in their book and share what I find quite interesting in the, um, in the section. So I'm not going to go through everything that you, uh, we can read in the book, but merely I will mostly share uh, the ideas that I find quite interesting. So on what can be forecasted? At first, I thought that this section would be um, rather obvious because of course we know that um, there are things that are easier to forecast, forecast than the others. Also, um, especially about this um, part about acknowledging what we can or cannot forecast accurately. But this pandemic has uh, made me realize that this is not always the case, that we don't really know what we think is easy, but apparently it's not easy at all. Or maybe there are people out there that doesn't really acknowledge what they can or cannot forecast accurately. So um, acknowledging the limit of forecasting. And I find, um, I find it really nice that they are elaborating um, the, f the predictability of an event, the factors that determine the predictability of an event um, into four factors. So how well we understand uh, something, how much data is available, 
how similar their future is to the past. And last but not least, whether the forecast can affect what we are forecasting. Well, I find it interesting because in the section, the authors later explain that in many problems, um, maybe the, the problem, well, only one factor is um, present. Like we have a lot of data, but we don't understand anything about the problem. And the, um, the past doesn't really connect well with the future. And yeah, and, and also, um, um, especially this fourth point about whether the forecast can affect what we are forecasting. So the uh, very attempt of forecasting itself, well we're, well, we're making the forecast because we want to act upon the forecasting uh, results and the act itself will change the future and it will also affect um, the future result of the forecasting. I find that um, quite interesting. So, and then on the next section, the authors elaborate on forecasting goals and planning. So the explanation here is a bit sparse, especially I don't have that much background. Well, I don't have any background at all on forecasting. So I'll try my best. So from what I understand, so forecasting is um, what we are uh, going to do in this course. So we want to predict the future as much as ex accurate as possible, given the available information and knowledge. And the goal is so what we would like to happen. So at first, I'm a bit confused on forecasting and goal, but I think so forecasting is just um, predicting, let's say, um, the gas price yesterday, uh, tomorrow, and goal maybe. Um, so, so goal is like, okay, for tomorrow, I want the gas price to be a certain dollar or euro per gallon. So it's like um, setting a target on the on what we are forecasting, and then afterwards for the planning, it's on the response to forecasts and goals. So from what I understand, it's like connecting the forecasts and goals. Okay, so based on the forecast, um, let's say tomorrow the price of gas is let's say just a uh, one hundred US dollar per barrel, but then, so that's the forecast, but our goal is actually um, $10 per barrel. So there is a big gap between the forecast and the goal. And um, yeah, we need to plan an action if there is such a, let's say discrepancy between what we forecasted and what we would like to happen. And I, again, I find this quite interesting because um, it really shows that forecasting is a really dynamic business. And well, to me, I find it interesting because I have never forecasted at all. And while well, I mostly do research and research is more about, well, you already have all the data and so on, just do whatever you can to explain what we see with what we find in the collected data. So it's not really as dynamic as forecasting seems to be. But that's the impression that I have in the uh, from this whole chapter actually. And um, yeah, so afterwards on determining what to forecast, I find that the authors put a lot of emphasis on, so before making a model to forecast, we should really spend a lot of time on talking to those who will use the forecast. So how will they actually use the forecast and what do they really need and why do they want a forecasting model in the first place? 
And I think it relates to, so also in this uh, subsection, they have, um, um, so they define forecasting activity based on the horizon and horizon is the, uh, from my understanding, it's the, um, so how far in the future we want to predict. So if it is just, um, so the authors divide it into short, medium and long-term. And for example, for the short term, it's more about um, determining, let's say how much um, raw materials we should make available so that our production line can keep going and going. And I think, yeah, it's mostly about, um, uh, well, what we should order tomorrow, what we should order next week so that the, the operation can keep going. And of course, it will be different if we want to forecast 10 years in the future, let's say how many people will, um, will there be in the earth um, in 10 years or in 2050, of course, um, what we will do to do such forecasting would be totally different. And also about the frequency of the forecast and this determine whether we would need automation. Of course, if um, the forecast or report is needed a daily, then it would be quite a burden to do all this like from nine to five to make sure everything is ready by the next day. And I think, um, yeah, this is where automation can be very um, crucial, especially in this uh, fast-paced um, forecasting. All right. And then in this section, the authors defied, um, so there are two major ways on how we can do uh, forecasting. So qualitative versus quantitative. So qualitative is mostly um, what we do when we don't have that many information or maybe we, um, when we don't have that much any information at all. For example, when we are in the beginning of this um, coronavirus pandemic where we don't have any information because this is a totally new virus, but then of course, it's not like we don't know anything at all about viruses or about pandemic. So we can make to some extent a good educated judgment on what would happen. So this will be discussed further in chapter six. So, and the quantitative is of course about the um, modeling, what we can do quantitatively to measure what's going to happen, um, to predict what's going to happen in the future. So they have uh, an, an example on uh, the Australian beer production in which, so um, the, the forecasting model here merely captured the seasonal pattern that has happened in the available data and replicated for the next two years. So here we can see the um, solid line is the average prediction and the shaded area represents the 80% and 95% prediction interval for the next two years. So I think in this um, section, the author is sort of trying to, um, to say, so. I don't really see the structure very well, but it seems like they are also dividing modeling practice into one. So just replicating the pattern um, that has happened in the past and then sort of copying it in the future. And the second one is trying to really understand the cause and effect. So the relation between the explanatory and the outcome variable. So here, um, the modeler doesn't really care about um, what has happened and what are the other factors that influence all this variation. It's more about just, okay, we are seeing 
um, we do see consistent pattern that fits, let's say, seasonality. And let's just continue it for the next two years, for example. So that's what I understand from this chapter. Okay. And the next is on the basic steps in forecasting. And well, when I see this uh, basic steps, of course, it's not linear. Just like the R4DS uh, book uh, flowchart, um, there are um, uh, many occasions when we have to iterate through the steps. Either let's say we already we are at this step and we want to redefine our problem and so on. But um, so briefly, the there are five steps in forecasting. So from defining a problem, gathering information, exploring the data, fitting the model, and then using and evaluating the model. So in problem definition, so again, I find it very interesting to see in this, um, in the explanation for this point, that there are not so much um, emphasis is put on, you know, uh, having a critical thinking on the problem itself, on the um, intricacies of the problem, but really about who's going to use the forecasting, who needs it, how it will be used. So it, so it seems, it appears to me that defining a problem in forecasting really relies on who actually require the forecast and how it will actually be used. So not really an intellectual exercise on the problem itself, but uh, mostly about how we can relate the problem to the bigger picture of things. And after we have defined the problem, then we can start getting the information and the information can be roughly divided into two, the statistical data, the numbers, or um, the, yeah, the numbers that we need that can explain the phenomenon that we are observing, as well as the, the domain knowledge. So the information that is essential for making judgments. And of course, before fitting a model, once we have collected in our information, we can always, or we should, or we must always start by visual, visualizing the data. And then especially for uh, time series uh, data, we can um, try to find if there are any consistent pattern of seasonality, or maybe we can try to link um, any changes in the pattern into major events that we know relate with the phenomenon that we are observing. And then afterwards, we can uh, fit the model. Michael, just a comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, they are in, in that third step on exploratory analysis. Uh, also, we could add uh, what is called uh, feature uh, engineering. OK, because uh, one, of the, one of the lessons that I have, you know, gathered from exploring different scenarios, you know, forecasting or traditional machine learning, etc., is that usually the power on predictability of your model relies more on good features. Okay, and the spot analysis will tell you, you know, what is, for example, in forecasting, uh, what is the lag. Uh, that you need, you know, lag effect. Uh, sometimes you can go, you know, very sophisticated with Laplace, you know, uh, transformers or whatever. So uh, that that point, I, I believe we're going to be, uh, you know, looking at certain examples when you need to add certain features so to increase your model uh, predictability, okay? And usually, you know, when you begin, when we begin the machine learning, usually we focus on the, on the, on, on the models, right? On, on the algorithms. But 
when you use, uh, you know, understand, you know, how is the model, you know, working, then you realize that the feature engineer is really, you know, the, the you, you, you get the superpower, <laughs> you know, the superpower of the data scientist is really on that, on that uh, feature engineer. Okay, so I, 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 I will add that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a really good point on, you know, making a discrete um, end goal of exploratory analysis. So it's not like a totally free exercise because um, in that case, then we don't really know the purpose of doing such analysis. And also it feels like aimless and it can take, you know, weeks or uh, many times longer than we allocate. I, I think that's a good uh, thing to add here. So thank you. So, yeah. So after the exploratory analysis, then of course we fit the model and would be better if we fit the model with the feature that we have engineered as the inspired through the exploratory analysis. And I think there are six chapters that will go into um, the specific model. Um, and but yeah, unfortunately, um, like gradient boosting is not one of them. So maybe we can, uh, of course, uh, put that into uh, one of the discussion that we have uh, will have in the future. Okay, and about using and evaluating the model. So I assume in the later chapter, well, it's not really clear to me. So I assume uh, in the a future chapter, there will be a way to assess the forecast accuracy. Of course, um, the true accuracy of our forecasting model um, will uh, not be, well, we will not be able to get it until um, the actual time itself or the actual event itself occurs. But I assume that there will be ways in which we can reliably judge how well our model holds um, or how well our model can um, uh, resist, um, well, can explain the uncertainty of forecasting the future. And there's also an element on using and acting on the forecast, which, um, yeah, again, it really um, complete the, well, it's not really full circle because it's uh, just aligned. So it's completing the, uh, the aim of the forecasting itself. So from determine, determining how the forecasting will be used and who needs it, and then afterwards acting upon the forecast like, okay, so if we know that based on our forecasting model, we'll have this event or we'll have this price for, I'd say for guests. So what should we do? How should we advise um, the executives, for example? I think communication would also communicating um, the results of our model now that I think of it, would also be a very important a skill to have in forecasting business. So um, yeah, that's basically it on the first chapter. It's not long. And oh, um, yeah, Kevin said about the M forecasting competition. Yeah, Richard, I actually reply, sent it by accident privately to Richard first, and then, and then he responded to me privately. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, I was just thinking going into the book that, I, like I've read parts of the book before, and I know that that's kind of the gold standard for evaluating a lot of these methods. and. Um, I just like wanted to do more competitions and um, and I think you learn a lot from them. So it'd be kind of cool to, if we get later in the book to maybe try out this year's data set. Um, yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, well, I, I just reply, you know, for Michael' uh, benefit. I just replied that the M6 competition is is currently, you know, uh, on. Yeah. And uh, precisely, uh, the business oh. guys, uh, Matt Danko, and you know, some of the students, uh, they yeah, have a yeah. team, and right now they are at, in the first in the first position. I mean, they're doing an excellent job, yeah. and they're doing they're, they're using the the tools that uh, Matt, you know, uh, uh, awesome. te teaches. Yeah, model time, time tech. Yeah. That, that's what they're using but the, he says but the secret stuff is not the package or it's not the algorithm it's the analysis okay it's the feature engineering is you know how, how how you know different 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 simulations that you can test this and test that and then you know try to get a coherent uh a solution so yeah nice but but yeah that they, 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 they have a great story there. they have a, a superb story Awesome. In fact, I know that the model time package was inspired by the M5. Mm. And Matt, Matt told, told that, that story too. The M5, the Walmart uh, sales. Mm -hmm. And we could look at that because, for example, uh, you need to do something called hierarchical uh, forecasting mm -hmm. for that model because there are you know, 10,000 products there. So uh, you need to do hierarchical, global. You, you, you need to do certain things you know, to try to cope with all those, uh, you know, all those, uh, uh, you know, different demands and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, M4, M5, M6, they have been, you know, propelling forecasting to where it is right now. <laughs> they, they run the whole year, right? Is that right? Yep. Like they, yeah. They, the, the M6 started, I think it started about three months ago. Okay. All right. Uh, usually they do it every, every two or three years. They do it. This one, I believe the M6, uh, you can check, you know, the the web page. This one is is, is for financials, uh, stock stock trading uh, forecast. That that's the problem there. Nice. Yeah. And of course, you know, you have to you have to look not only the pattern of the stock, but also you know certain news, certain economic factors that could affect you know the, the price of the stock. So yeah, yeah it yeah. sounds nice because well. The primary reason why I want to do this book club is not mm -hmm. because, well, I'm um, having a lazy time on Sunday and think, hey, why don't I spend this time more effectively by learning forecasting? Not at all. Right, right. But so I <laughs> came across this a Kaggle competition on stock exchange prediction. Okay. So that's um, what I'm, I was thinking of. But mm -hmm. yeah. I am quite interested in this M6 competition, especially when you said that the competition takes a whole year. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I find it. Oh yeah, it the, the, they're, just, the, the, they're just starting. Show. Right now, yeah. they're just starting, okay? They got the All second, right. you know, like the second stage and they're doing very well. But, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, okay? You have to keep improving, you know, your models and, you know, yeah. keep at it. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a real time practice. I tell you, I can forecast that, you know, Matt, team is going to do pretty well i don't know if it's going to be you know in the first you know uh, in the in the, the final I, I wish you know i wish him very well but i think he's they're going to do very well and uh you know it's going to be a, a great story uh, for 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 mad and the, the people that are putting a lot of effort there and we can learn and we can learn from them of course <laughs> because eventually you know he, he will say you know what 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 happened really yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's my main, obviously, or I think that's why we're all here, you know, is to learn. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think with these competitions, like you, you see what the best, the best is in terms of algorithms, mm -hmm. like whole workflow, you know, yeah. and, and then, yeah, like the power of going deep on something and then having, and then being able to see what a bunch of other people did. And like, there's just, right. when you go deep on something and then see what, how other people approached it, I think that's really, yeah, super cool. So, um, uh -huh. I'm just I, I, now, so I'm just putting a profile into. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember, you know, when I started, uh, you know, learning this stuff uh, a couple of years ago, that um, uh, we did a presentation. You know, uh, I'm in Orlando, just in case. Uh, we have the the meetup, Orlando Machine Learning and Data Science, and there was uh, a person that did a presentation on the M4, uh, the M4 competition. And that one, if I'm not mistaken, Uber, uh, you know, the, the right, the, the right faring guys, Uber team was the one that took the first spot. Mm. 
And apparently they use uh, uh, different models, different models for forecasting. And that's another lesson also. Uh, usually not one uh, model you know, does, the, does the job. Usually you have to combine uh, different because depending on the patterns, right? Some models are better yeah. for certain patterns than others. So the, the, the secret sauce of them was to combine uh, a couple of models you know, to achieve you know, that high, high accuracy rate. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's a lot of stuff that you can learn from that. You know, from from those competition, also from 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 Kaggle too. Yeah. Yeah, Mikhail, I think I also saw you, that same thing on Kaggle. I was I was just browsing Kaggle recently and saw that <laughs> market one. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to like do a few a year or something like that to to stay stay fresh. Um, right. Yeah. Stay sharp. Yeah. <laughs> It's like even if you're doing data stuff at work, like the you're not exposed to like a really wide range of problems and like mm -hmm. opportunities to use the, a lot of these techniques. So um, I feel like you kind of have to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but. Oh, yeah. So I have right. to register for the M6. Who will see? <laughs> Hey, who yeah. knows? Maybe, maybe we'll get our chance in M7, you know? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there, there are about there are about 800 teams uh, working in the M6 right now. So I bet you know it's going to get it's going to get bigger. You know, the more people know about it, it's going to get bigger. Yeah. And uh, and let me tell you, just you know, I I I don't think I don't know really. I don't, I don't know if there's a price, you know, because, because some Kaggle position have prices. I don't know mm -hmm. if there's a price, but that's not the, the main thing. The main thing is that, man, you, you want an M competition, man, you're good. <laughs> you, you're recognized, you know, uh, automatically. Yeah, <laughs> you, you have to be. <laughs> and if you are in the top 10 or something, hey, that, that's, a great, that's a great resume, you know, uh, <laughs> eye-catching thing, especially if you are doing forecasting. Uh, you know, at work. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that, I mean, some competition, I think, would be one of, um, yeah, it's like a discrete learning goal because even if we are, even if I'm not doing great in the competition, at least I know mm -hmm. how I'm doing. It's like right. it's providing right. a direct feedback. Yeah. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Nice, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it would be, yeah, yeah. I would look forward to spending time on this as well. But I'll start with the basics first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> start with the foundation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I know nothing about this space. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay, so yeah, do you have, um, do you all have any other things to discuss? I just had one question about the presentations. Um, are we planning on like building a, like a book down type thing or? Uh... Yes, I plan to, even though I didn't. It's mostly because I, it, well, um, I did this like in the last hour. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm but not. If I, if I do have the time, I would do that. Okay, so so when we present the chapters, we'll be kind of right authoring a, a chapter as we're doing it. Yes, yes, huh. I would do that. Yeah, I would prefer to do that for the upcoming um, mm -hmm. chapters. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, sounds good. I haven't, don't think I've really been in a cohort since they started doing the book down books. Uh, that has like been the first one, but it's a good good opportunity to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. learn a lot as well doing that all right if we don't have any further thing to discuss then i guess we can end early and um i'll let you back to your uh, granddaughter birthday party because thank you yeah all right. <laughs> probably there will be you know, grabbing me again, you know, for the singing right. and the cake and okay. the thing. <laughs> okay. 
So nice meeting you all and thanks for coming. Yep. So I'll see you next week. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right, bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>